with Alison Herring and who can um, introduce uh, herself in these um, three minutes. So Alessa, I think the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Yama. Uh, I hope you can um, see my screen now. Yes, we yes, can. Yes. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. So yeah, hi everyone, it's me again, this time as an author, not as a social chair. I'm Alessa Herring from Frauen und Mavis, and I'm presenting our paper, Whole Body uh, Soft Tissue Lesion Tracking and Segmentation Longitudinal CT Imaging Studies. Um, I probably don't have to tell you that the percentage of people who have cancer in their lifetime is increasing. increasing. Fortunately, uh, therapies are becoming more successful and new therapies are being developed. Both yields to a higher workload of radiologists who um, have to evaluate the efficiency of the cancer treatment. The measurement of metastatic tumors on longitudinal CT scans is essential to evaluate the efficiency of the cancer treatment. Before treat the treatment begins, a baseline CT scan is acquired, on which the radiologist has to find the metastasis and the whole body. And um, after three, uh, typically three months, a second scan is used to determine if the treatment was successful uh, by comparing it to the baseline image. This comparison is time consuming and therefore our goal is to make a routine tumor follow up quick um, assessment quicker and more reliable through a software assistant workflow. Um, in our interviews uh, with the radiologist, we learned that they don't want to be taken out of the loop completely. Uh, they still want to interact with the software. However, the interaction should be as small as possible. So the smallest interaction I could think of is just one click. And therefore, our pipeline starts with one click of the radiologist inside the lesion that should be measured. But instead of me explaining the pipeline to you using this slide, I'll try, uh, let's try it out directly. So um, let's move on here. We have our baseline scan on the left and the follow-up scan on the right. And as you can see here, here's a soft tissue lesion which we want to segment. We can choose uh, which kind of lesions we want to segment and this time a soft tissue uh, lesion. And then we click into the lesion. The lesion is automatically segmented on the fly, so nothing is pre-computed here. And um, yeah, measured, so we saw this diameter. Moreover, a structure is um, created here to archive and save the um, lesion later on. So then when we get the follow-up scan, we can um, propagate it to the follow-up scan. And we could do that automatically, but uh, to show it in a nicer way, I have this uh, propagate button. So we propagate it and again, the lesion is segmented and uh, uh, measured and yeah, we're done. So we have our uh, structures here and now we can create a report out of it. This uh, works in um, most cases uh, quite well, as you have seen before, but uh, obviously there are some cases which uh, on which it's not working. So we included all the cases here on which uh, um, our algorithm failed, kind of. Also in the baseline, it's uh, sometimes okay, but in the follow-up, we have some problems. So um, one uh, reason for that is uh, that the registration was not accurate enough, like here. So in the baseline image, it was fine, and um, in the follow-up image, the yellow uh, line here indicates the propagate lesion, it was too far away, and therefore the correct lesion was not segmented. Sometimes the um, uh, lesion is um, hard to distinguish from the surrounding um, uh, tissue, like here in this case. So as you see, there are some problems we have to address first to really um, be able to handle all kinds of lesions, but uh, it's already uh, um, pretty good. As you can see here, we have an average dice uh, score of 0 0.79 uh, on the baseline image and 0 0.8 on the follow-up images. So uh, what's, what's next to bring it into the clinic? We want to use uh, the knowledge of the appearance of the baseline um, lesion uh, for the follow-up segmentation, not only the position, because there are more information in it. Uh, we have to consider that the lesion can split or merge uh, over time. And obviously, we have also to train the pipeline for more uh, lesion types and evaluate it for different uh, tumor entities and so on. Um, one really important point is also that we have to uh, evaluate our trained networks um, and look uh, for biases. So for gender or ethnicities or scanner types, etc. That's super important and it's often forgotten. And obviously, we have to just try it out in the clinic and see what's happening where uh, some other issues occur. So that's it, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Anessa, for the very interactive demo. 
Uh, so, save your questions for the discussion there. You can also put them in the chat here. And the next speaker is Manon Lalitz. Hello, everyone. I'll share my screen now. Uh, can you all see my screen? We can, yes. Awesome. So hello again, uh, I'm Manan. I'm a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden. So to give some motivation behind the work that we present in my lab or in, our, in the lab that I work at, we study the early development of an organism. And this is a complex process that's accompanied by dynamic morphological changes and genetic changes. So now the morphological changes are typically, typically imaged through light sheet microscopy. And the dynamic genetic changes are imaged as static snapshots imaged with confocal microscopy. And in my PhD project, I would like to associate nuclei based on uh, similarity in morphology. So now uh, coming to the goal of uh, extracting morphology from an image, we turn to instance segmentation and that as we know, is the task of identifying a region that corresponds to a certain class. So in this case, we're looking at the region that's expressing the nuclei marker. And then partitioning this region such that all individual objects are assigned a unique label or ID. To begin with, we looked at uh, what could be the desirable properties for instance segmentation approaches. And uh, we think uh, having a low GPU memory requirement, having providing a non-parametric object representation and directly optimizing over the intersection over union metric during training are desirable properties. We were very impressed by the family of embedding based approaches. Uh, and they show very good results on the natural image domain. So here we start wondering, could this be translated to the biomedical domain as well? So this work that I just showed you uh, essentially does the following task. It looks at the pixels belonging to an object and tries to cluster them at the center of the object. But this could be a problem if the center is defined as a centroid, because multiple objects could have the same centroid. And this leads to merging of these two instances at inference. So here the reason that a better idea is to use the midoid as the center, because it has a desirable property of always falling within the object being investigated. And this leads to better demarcation of the two objects. With this and some of the modifications, we propose embed seg. Here you can see some qualitative results of a method uh, and the predictions are shown as the, in the last column, whereas the ground truth is shown in this column for reference. Next, we extended this method to 3D. We extended the neural architecture to 3D and we also made available four new 3D datasets for public benchmarking. Uh, here are some qualitative results. Here you can see the X, Y, Y, Z, and ZX slices of some raw image the corresponding ground truth image that it should map to and the embed set predictions. To summarize, we translated spatial embedding to the biomedical domain. We extended the method to 3D. We showed our modifications boost results and all code and example notebooks are provided at this URL. And lastly, we try to integrate now embed sec with, uh, with a, a GUI. So here you can see uh, training on the GUI. Uh, and this is a work in progress and we hope that with this, people can train embed seg on their standard laptops that come with modest, lap, modest GPUs with ease. With this, I thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions later. Thank you very much, Manon. And then it's on to our third speaker of the session. Um, I don't see him yet in the panelists, but I know that he's in session, so maybe someone can promote him to co-host. Oak Epidek. I see you also raised the hand already. In the meantime, maybe we can take a quick question from the chat. Um, oh, I see Owen is here. Okay, well, feel free, free to take the floor. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, can you hear me? Okay. And uh, let's share my screen. All right, so. Uh, all right, so 
I am Oel Karvadek, and I will be presenting our work uh, beyond pixel wise supervision. So to give you a um, quick overview of what we did is in that paper is that uh, Instead of supervising um, a neural network at training time using uh, individual pixel uh, labels, uh, we decided to see if we could uh, supervise the network not by describing what class each pixel should have, but instead uh, by describing to the network in general where the object should be and what shape it should have. So we didn't want to micromanage uh, the pixels of the output of a network, as it is usually done. But rather, we wanted to, to simply describe where it should be. And to motivate uh, a bit um, this idea on top of, we wanted to know if it worked. But another motivation is that cross entropy or dice uh, actually do not take the image uh, shape into account. If we do an experiment and compute a cross entropy and dice on this ground truth, uh, sample ground truth and sample prediction, we'll get some values and that's fine. But if we simply reorder the pixels in a corresponding fashion, uh, we'll get the same values. And what we notice is that cross entropy and dice simply uh, do not care about pixels position. Uh, you can compute your dice on a flattened array and not on an input image and you, you will get the same value out of it. So rather what we do is that uh, we use uh, standard computer vision uh, descriptors uh, that are updated for deep learning uh, setting. And we use it to describe, for instance, where the object is, where is its center, or how spread it is between uh, each axis. And we then show a way to supervise uh, the neural network with each descriptor that we have uh, defined. So it's allowed us to, this proves that this was working. Actually, we can supervise a network just by describing where the object should be, what shape it should have, and without telling to the network uh, a response for each pixel. So here we can see what happens when we supervise with 65,000 uh, label per image. And this is when we use only four descriptors per image. So in the end, we have much less supervision um, in the traditional sense um, that we give to the neural network. But we, are, we can see that we are able to get uh, a prediction that is actually really close to the ground truth. And the network has successfully learned uh, the relationship between the different class of this problem. And then, but this is more details uh, that can come later. We also show that descriptors that were presented in the paper in 2D can be generalized to 3D and could be used to deal with uh, um, 4D scan and uh, multiple time point scans. And so thank you for listening. And I think that's it for the three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, perfectly on time. Uh, so now the floor is open for discussion, and we already have some questions in the in the chat. And um, I propose we we just start with the uh, first presentation. So one of the questions there was um, uh, whether you have considered as a, uh, any other metrics than the dice similarity coefficient to evaluate the under or over segmentation in your method. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so we are. Uh evaluated this uh, surface dice, which allows a small threshold around, um, so a, a bit of, um, which is not aligned uh, or not, not, not segmented. But we also uh, measured the um, surface distance and the host of distance. But I guess it's uh, still a good idea to evaluate more uh, metrics, uh, especially for research purposes. But in the end, the guidelines are only, so in the clinic only focuses on the diameter. So this was a segmentation approach, um, but um, later on, we, we just want to uh, evaluate uh, the diameter. So that will be the next step we will take. Thank you. And I see a related question to the segmentation aspect, which uh, algorithm did you actually use to segment the lesions? Yeah, yeah, due to the success uh, of the NN unit and all the uh, challenges, yeah, we just decided to use that. And it's uh, pretty good. Um, but we can also talk about more details about uh, the um, uh, the algorithm on our poster uh, presentation later on. Great. 
Thank you. So, um, let me go with the second presentation related question. And uh, first is not the questions kind of compliment, <laughs> say um, thanks for the effort um, to share the, the data. I think that's really important. Uh, when, one question from Thomas, why um, does this approach has low GP requirements uh, to Manan? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, there, basically there are two reasons actually. So when we try to extend Nevin et al, uh, the embedding based approach to the biomedical domain, they were already using a very sparse version of the REST net, which they call as the ERF net. And this was designed for real time inference for uh, smart driving vehicles. So it was already very sparse and that leads to low memory requirement. And secondly, we tried to integrate virtual batching where we actually use a batch size of one or two, but we apply a batch multiplier so that it simulates a large batch size. Uh, so with these two modifications, we hope that the GP requirement is low. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, do you want to go with the sec uh, third presentation's questions? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, so we actually, we have quite some questions for, uh, for Owell which is a good sign, I think, which is a very thought-provoking paper. Uh -huh. I think one question um, uh, that I also had is, uh, how would this work for more complex shapes? So it's, what happens if you have a more heterogeneous shape? Would your method still work in that case? Um, so for now, we don't know exactly where, how far it could go. Um, so we stick with really basic um, shape moments and only first or third order. Um, so those could be pushed uh, much further and there are different class of uh, transforms that uh, we haven't investigated yet so the answer for now uh, to keep it short is we don't know yet it possibly because there are still many possibilities to to investigate that could be done uh, the trickiest setting will be to try to supervise uh, brain lesions and things like that um, but for organs that are deformable, there is probably different ways to, to deal with them. And yeah, I'm seeing the chat, there is quite a bit of them. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can I just pick one more question, Minyoung, that, uh, that came up in the study group that we had this morning? So mm -hmm. uh, Ashley was wondering, um, uh, what if you combine this, and have you tried to combine this with a more conventional loss? Um, no, not for now. Uh, it started, that paper started for me just seeing how far uh, descriptors could go. They are traditionally used as regularizers. So what you ask is actually what some people have been doing for a while. But I really wanted to see if I could simply completely bypass uh, pixel-wise supervision. That at the end of the day, I don't find it super elegant. That way that you say this pixel should be this one, this one, that one, that one. So, it started as a benchmarking, and when it turned out it actually could go that far, I didn't went back to the regularizer um, usage of uh, descriptors. Yeah, I think we have uh, quite a lot of questions about um, uh, your presentation. Um, so let me go with another uh, question. So basically, it's kind of related question. Um, the question you just answered to um, anything you can, you know, combine the with the um, kind of you can you can do kind of mixed mixed order based supervision, like first order pixel wide uh, cross entropy, and second order um, um, for the boundary loss. Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't is get that question. Is the latest question in the chat box? Basically, you know, uh, whether you compared your method, um, yeah, to kind of mixed, uh, mixed order based supervision, oh, first okay. order uh, plus second order, uh, um, which are pixel wise cross entropy and boundary loss, respectively. Uh, no, we did not compare to it. Um, my point was not to see who was the best, but for now it was just to see if it could work and, um, now um, we believe it shows us different way to think about uh, the way we supervise. Uh, I've seen the question from Francesco to to Fordy, and 
And I think that's one of the exciting uh, usage of uh, possibly descriptors. I will share uh, some content again. Um, so the question, he, he was asking if uh, you need to have annotation at each time point. And I think the interest is once you go away from pixel, uh, pixel wise based labels, you can annotate a single uh, time point, uh, have the description of the object shape that could be used then for any time point. So for instance, is the, uh, in the case of the cardiac cycle, if you have, if you have one annotation at the systole and one at the diastole, uh, and you compute the description at those time points, then you have a natural lower and upper bounds uh, of those values that can be, that are actually valid for any time point. So it could be a way, uh, depending on the task, uh, we believe to, to have descriptors that are valid for the same patient, but any scan that comes in the future or on different tasks, perhaps we could even have higher order descriptors that are valid for any patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, um, there is actually a, a question from um, the in the chat, um, which is to all percent is what I will post it to Manan uh, here. Uh, do you think that medical image segmentation will be solved in the next years? Um, during or after you finish your PhD? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, I think. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, the results seem to be getting better. So I, I think I'm optimistic, actually. Like, okay. if not within the next year, then yeah, a couple of years, maybe. Okay, I think this is an interesting point for discussion because I see how well uh, maybe doesn't agree with that. Uh well, I guess it depends what you mean by solving. Um, I think that it will still take some time. Uh, we definitely see some progress in organ segmentation, and uh, uh, but some area will remain tricky, um, I think, just simply because it's already super hard for uh, doctors and radiologists to figure out where brain lesions are, and they cannot even really agree exactly where it is. Uh, so solving uh, it with machine learning seems for me a bit tricky for now, uh, to say yes. the least. I would agree with well on that point. So, and also because uh, the image modalities will change or some will change. So we have continuously work on new tasks. And because uh, for example, CT scans uh, or the resolution will be getting better, then uh, we can see things in the scans, which we haven't seen before. And therefore we have to do, um, yeah, find new uh, algorithms for that. And maybe then we get another uh, problem with it. Also in ultrasound uh, segmentation is still way harder than on CT scans. So we also have to think uh, of other modalities which are not that present at the moment uh, here on our conference maybe. So there will likely be another segmentation section uh, next year. Let's, let's assume that. Okay. Um, Alison, now we have you here. Uh, there's another thing that came up in our discussion this morning in the study group about your paper, um, uh, which is that uh, we noticed that there was no deep learning in the in the registration of your uh, method. Do you think there's anything to gain uh, there? Um, yes. So, uh, like I uh, tried to say on um, the step that we're using, at the moment we are just using the position to propagate the uh, lesion um, to the follow-up image but uh, we are not using the appearance of uh, the lesion in the baseline. But typically when you have a round lesion, it will shrink or expand, but the shape will stay probably the same. So we can get more information into, um, um, into the follow-up segmentation. And therefore I think it's a good way to use um, a joint registration segmentation, uh, segmentation approach for that so that we also uh, input the um, segmentation mask and the segment, uh, the lesion um, of the uh, baseline image into our segmentation network or registration network uh, for the follow-up image. So yeah, I uh, would agree on that, that we can gain a lot out of that. Yeah, I, I also have a quick question to Alyssa. And in the paper, you demonstrated one follow-up you know, scans result. And what about uh, whether you um, compared multiple you know, follow-up scans result and whether they are you know, consistent whether they can benefit from previous time scan or you know first time scan uh, 
can you explain um, that part? I think that could be very interesting if you can extend this on the multiple time scans uh, in practice. Yeah, so uh, obviously when we can include more information into the algorithm, it will uh, hopefully uh, get better. Um, so it was just a first um, yeah, uh, approach to see how good we can uh, get, especially with um, methods that are already present. Um, like the NN unit, why should we uh, yeah, find some new algorithm when the NN unit is so good? Because we want to solve a clinical problem and not only uh, find technology. So I think, yeah, you're right when we do that, uh, and that will be the next steps to do so. Great, thank you. I think uh, we have to wrap up the discussion and the, and the session here. Um, but it was very interesting, very nice to see three very different papers. And, uh, well, even though it's virtual, a uh, very nice and dynamic discussion here. Uh, thanks a lot to the presenters and for the audience. And I think that there is now in the program, uh, I think Alessa probably knows best. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, okay, I switch back to my social uh, chair role now. Um, yeah, we have a short break. Um, you can uh, walk around Gathertown and uh, talk uh, with uh, all the others. Um, get a cup of coffee uh, and then in um, 10 minutes uh, approximately you have to split into the short oral A or short oral B room. So decide on which track you want to follow. Then go to the room, uh, press X again and join the WebEx meeting there. And then, um, yeah, we can start with the second uh, uh, session. Thanks, Yama and uh, for uh, sharing this session. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I